So it's Uh, I'd just like to welcome you all um, to this uh, webinar uh, this afternoon, and um, I would like. And it's fantastic that we've got people from across the globe here this um, afternoon. So I sort of um, welcome to you all, and there will be an opportunity for um, questions. And if you can put them into the um, the question and answer box, we'll then um, James will uh, um, answer them later. And uh, and again, any sort of general chat, um, just pop those into the. Uh, now I've just noticed I've got a, a battery problem, so let me just sort it. I don't know why that's happened. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, my uh, plug had come undone. Right, sorry, back to that. Right, I would like to, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, James Morris, um, who's a research fellow at London South Bank University. And he's got a, a particular interest in alcohol problems, stigma and the framing and, um, and problem recognition. Uh, he's got close to 20 years of experience in the alcohol field. And I think actually Betsy, Tom and I have probably known you from most of that. Uh, and uh, he also has lived experience of problem drinking. Uh, he, uh, James recently launched the Alcohol Problem podcast, uh, which aims to explore the nature of problem uh, drinking with a number of academics and um, also through the lived uh, experience perspective. And um, I recommend the first one that I've listened to, which is with Adrian Charles. So I would recommend that to people to, um, uh, check that one out. He's also editor of Alcohol Policy UK and chair of the New Directions in the Study of Alcohol um, group. And today he's going to talk to us about his PhD uh, research. Um, and his presentation is Why Harmful Drinkers Reject Change, Coping and Cognition in Maintaining Heavy Drinking. And um, at the start, he, we're going to put out a poll question. It's not a test, but we'd love you to answer it. And then I think, and James will be able to pick up on those, um, the responses later in his um, talk. So I think that's enough from me. And um, over to the important person, James. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel. And yeah, definitely yourself and Betsy uh, have, you know, kind of remember back starting in the alcohol field very fondly and, and kind of the support and work that we've done together over the years. So thanks very much for inviting me, it's a pleasure. So yeah, today I'm gonna to talk about uh, why harmful drinkers reject change, um, coping and co cognition and maintaining heavy drinking. Um, so this is kind of like a, a kind of more scientific, if you like, exploration of what might be commonly called denial, but um, kind of questioning the validity of that, but um, hopefully that will become, will, will make more sense. Um, so we're going to start off with a bit of a straw poll. Uh, so some questions should pop up and um, as Rachel says, it's not a test, but uh, it hopefully will be useful in kind of informing some of the, the discussion and uh, content. So you should have four answers. And essentially, what, what reason do you think most people with alcohol use disorders, you know, some level of risk or harm from their drinking, uh, tend not to see their drinking as problematic? So the social acceptability or cultural normalisation of it, of alcohol use, uh, the stigma of having a problem, uh, or because people don't see themselves as an alcoholic as such because they're in control functioning performing their kind of everyday duties so therefore they might not see themselves as problematic uh, because they don't fit that stereotype or finally um, is it just mainly down to poor alcohol awareness or poor literacy around units and guidelines so thank you for engaging everybody we so far have 79 responses um, oh it's steadily going up 81 responses give it another sort of five to ten seconds so if you haven't voted and, and you'd like to be involved please do vote thank you okay 
okay we now have 88 i think i'm gonna oh i'm gonna end polling and then another, another one popped in i'll end polling down and share the results immediately thanks christiana so really interesting so this kind of third option, 70% uh, of people, I assume from the numbers, you can tick more than one option. I didn't realize that, but that's absolutely fine. So yes, yeah, 70% of people have put, uh, that people do not see themselves as an alcoholic in inverted commas. Um, for instance, they still see themselves, their drinking as in control and themselves as healthy. So um, that, that's really that's really useful to know because um, that's something we will be, I will be exploring quite a bit of and yeah kind of uh, a good level of um, engagement of some of the other questions as well so yeah I think that's really useful thanks so I'll just briefly cover um, some objectives or an overview of what I'm going to uh, address today so Harmful drinkers basically is a key alcohol use disorder population. So I'll, I'll start off by just kind of defining who harmful drinkers are or how we might define them. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about how the, this group is characterized by low problem recognition. Um, so obviously low problem recognition, you know, you could argue it's a significant barrier to change because people tend not to change their behavior unless they see any reason to do so. So I'll explore what maybe drives this low problem recognition and then finish or close to the end with a, a kind of conceptual model for how we might think about promoting or increasing problem recognition amongst this group. So to start off by defining harmful drinkers, um, anyone who's kind of heard me speak before will be familiar with this, so I apologise, but um, essentially there's it's defined as people who consume alcohol at levels on a regular basis, which already causes negative or psychological effects. So the, the, the physical effects could obviously be a whole range of, you know, over 60 different medical conditions. Um, and then the whole range of negative psychological effect, effects, you know, common anxiety, uh, depression, like symptoms, poor sleep, mood, well-being, all those kind of things. So, you know, I'm sure everyone's aware that the more you drink, the more your chances of, of alcohol-related problems go up. But there is a kind of threshold at which, um, you know, these effects, you're almost certainly likely to have one or more negative effects. And in, in the UK, this harmful drinking threshold is de defined in terms of 35 uh, units or more for women or 50 units or more for men over the course of a week. And of course, there's um, the alcohol use disorders identification test is the kind of gold standard global assessment tool for measuring alcohol uh, use disorders and typically a, a score of 16 to 20 or 16 or above would, would be the kind of threshold for harmful drinking. But it's important to note that, uh, that, that generally speaking, and most mostly in the context of what I'm saying, harmful drinkers are uh, distinct from what we typically understand as dependent drinkers. They're kind of below the threshold of, of having alcohol dependence or at least moderate or severe dependence where typically we would assume people would benefit from treatment engagement. So they may be what we might call sub-threshold dependent drinkers. But, but the reason the harmful drinkers, I think, are such an important group is because their, you know, their numbers are significantly more than the, the this kind of six hundred thousand dependent drinkers that Public Health England target for, or you know, say should be uh, engaging in treatment services. So, um, you know, there's about one point three million harmful drinkers who don't meet the criteria for for alcohol dependence that that's associated usually with with treatment engagement. But there's still a very significant public health group in terms of the impact on society. So we know, for instance, that one in five of people admitted to hospital are drinking at harmful levels. Um, so you know that's, that ref reflects the very significant health implications for, for drinking at harmful levels. Um, so who are harmful drinkers? Well, um, I've kind of got a cartoon of Andy Cap because. Uh, he, I'll refer to him later, but perhaps more famously is Adrian Charles. And um, as uh, Rachel mentioned, he's in the first episode of my podcast because you know he's he uh, is quite famous for his 2018 documentary called Drinkers Like Us, where he 
you know, kind of explored his own alcohol use, having identified that he was drinking maybe around 80 units a week or more even, and went through this kind of process of meeting different people, experts, people with lived experience, and reflecting on his alcohol use and kind of deciding that he uh, wanted to cut down and, and has since really done so and has really been a great champion for the issue since. So Adrian Charles is probably the most famous example, certainly in the UK, of a, a harmful drinker. But, um, you know, there's other people that we might be familiar with. Um, so th th these characters, are, I think, are great fun uh, on from Gogglebox, Stefan Dom. Um, you know, uh, I don't know exactly what their alcohol consumption is, but they have been kind of certainly at least portrayed as you know, quite heavy drinkers. Um, because every time they appear, they're, they're kind of deciding what, what they want to drink when they watch, watch TV. And you know, as you can see here, he's kind of got this giant martini glass and uh, kind of making a, <laughs> they're kind of proud of, proud of their, their enjoyment of alcohol, if you like. But I'd hazard a guess they drink at certainly risky, if not harmful levels. Um, there was a study uh, where they anal analysed all the James Bond novels and found that they uh, thought his weekly alcohol consumption was over 90 units a week. So that obviously qualifies as drinking at a harmful level, although this kind of Guardian article late decided to label him as an, an alcoholic, uh, which is, I think, problematic and we'll come to later, perhaps. Um, and then this is a kind of picture of me with some of my uh, kind of people that I played golf with. And um, so the people I played golf with often uh, joke and say, well, you're just using us for a kind of uh, for your studies, aren't you? And I kind of say, well, kind of, yeah, <laughs> because they are, um, you know, by their own admission, quite, quite, you know, uh, heavy drinkers. Um, and, and as Rachel said at the start, I've experienced alcohol problems in the past, certainly as a result of harmful drinking. So I think the point really here is that harmful drinkers are, you know, not necessarily uh, aligned with the stereotypes of, of so-called alcoholics, that they're, they're kind of functioning and, uh, um, you know, kind of many people that we know or even ourselves perhaps. So just in a kind of public health perspective, um, if we look at a, a model of, of how we address alcohol use disorders, generally, We've got this kind of treatment population, people with moderate or severe dependence at the top, as I said, about 600,000 people. If we look at people with mild alcohol dependence or, you know, which is kind of a very similar group or overlapping group with harmful drinkers, um, just about 1% of those people receive any kind of specialist psychological interventions. So I think there's an unmet need in terms of public health interventions um, and obviously question marks about how well brief interventions or, or other messages might reach harmful drinkers, which I'll come on to more later. But, but when we say harmful drinkers reject change, or when I say that in, in the kind of title, what do I mean by that? Um, essentially, it's, it's because harmful drinkers can be characterised by low problem recognition. Um, you know, they underestimate their drinking levels more than any other alcohol use disorder group. Um, uh, that you know, they really just significantly play down how much they drink. Um, and in this study that, that I published with colleagues from my PhD studies, we found that harmful drinkers rated their own drinking risk and problems at the same or not, not different levels from, from non-harmful drinkers, despite having a audit C score of 37% higher. So, you know, despite drinking harmfully, they just say, essentially that their drinking is not problematic uh, and this kind of might be described as unrealistic optimism so uh, you know pe people with alcohol use disorders have been identified as having high levels of unrealistic optimism essentially just playing down or really avoiding thinking about their alcohol use and, and potential risks associated with it um, and and instead they tend to emphasize their drinking as, as uh, positive that they're in control of their alcohol use, that they're still going to work, that, um, you know, that, that they enjoy alcohol, that it's a positive part of their life. Um, so, yeah, you know, we can identify that they're, they're actually technically harmful drinkers, but that's certainly not how they tend to see it. That's what we mean by kind of low problem recognition or rejecting change. So the question then that might follow is, well, why can't we just say that they're in denial and, um, I've got this uh, picture of uh, D 
deny the Nile in Egypt, uh, based on the kind of famous joke that uh, uh, denial was not just a river in Egypt. But um, denial is an insufficient stereotype, really, to capture the complex reasons for low problem recognition. So denial, you know, mainly is associated with ideas of hitting rock bottom and Alcoholics Anonymous, where you know, the idea that alcohol problems have to be very severe before you kind of have an awakening and, and address change. But, but actually, if we look at problem recognition um, in a broader sense, then, then denial is, is not really going to be a helpful way of thinking about it. Uh, and particularly because other explanations for problem recognition might include, as we looked at through the poll, that the idea of alcohol use being socially acceptable, so harmful drinkers see themselves as social drinkers rather than problem drinkers. Um, but is this because they believe that they're, they're not problem drinkers because as the poll, uh, as most people voted in the, in the poll, that because they see themselves as functioning and healthy, they don't identify or connect any health problems they have with their drinking. Uh, and maybe all their friends are heavy drinkers as well, therefore they don't see themselves as alcoholics. Um, or is it also uh, perhaps because, you know, that they're aware on some level that their drinking is problematic, but they're also very aware that having a, a problem drinking label is very stigmatizing and threatening. Um, so, you know, that might be a bit more akin to the kind of idea of denial of sort of being aware of it, but not, not facing up to it, if you like. Um, or finally, is it just a lack of awareness? So we know that awareness of units and the recommended guidelines is low. Um, and we also know that, that harmful drinkers or people who experience alcohol problems often don't connect their problems with the alcohol use. So it could be poor sleep, it could be high blood pressure, it could be low mood. You could you know, experience those as a result of your alcohol use, but not connect the two. Well, really, it's a bit of um, all of the above, uh, I think, play a role to some degree. But, but certainly the poll, the, the option that most people selected of this kind of uh, othering between themselves and alcoholics, I think is certainly a key driver. And that's, that's what I'll come on to in a bit. But the, the, it does feed off this idea of alcohol use as socially acceptable. You know, so alcohol, despite being a uh, potentially dangerous and addictive drug, if you don't, if you're not perceived to have a problem with your alcohol use, it's perfectly socially acceptable. But in public health terms, we define problem drinking perhaps as either hazardous drinking, harmful drinking, or having alcohol dependence. But you know, in terms of the, how the public think about or talk about alcohol use, as we heard from um, Claire at the last dark seminar. Um, you know, people don't really use those terms or that conceptualization. Instead, they might talk about social or binge drinking or alcoholism. Uh, so it doesn't really match up with, with the kind of slightly more uh, nuanced or risk oriented frame, public health framework. Um, and there's this really good quote that um, someone called uh, Katie Vitkovitz, who's a fantastic uh, American based researcher who's done uh, loads of fantastic work around kind of harmful drinking groups and so on. And she says in, the, in this podcast episode, you know, we have a, a serious us versus them situation going on in our society. Uh, everyone can drink as much as we want and we glorify it until you have an alcohol use disorder and then you're just, you can never drink again. Well, she's not saying then you can never drink again. She's saying that's how society portrays it. You know, drink as much as you lo like as long as you're not you know, causing problems in the way that, that society defines it. But if you do have a problem, then you have to go abstinent and never drink again. Um, and, and kind of part of this uh, problem is, is maybe, or reflection of this is, is this idea of kind of drinking identities. So that harmful drinkers tend to have very positive drinking identities. You know, they're quite invested in their self view as, as a drinker and you know, there's, there's this whole range of, of really good literature showing how, you know, we construct views of ourselves based on our roles and our responsibilities, our values, our friendship groups and our beliefs. That, that that's how we construct the, the, the sense of self that we have. Um, and therefore, as humans, we're, quite, we're highly motivated to maintain our sense of, of self-integrity, of kind of seeing ourselves as... as uh, good people through these beliefs and the mind kind of subconsciously has this working self system that seeks to 
maintain and, and keep this positive self-image going. Um, so these kind of identity related self-concepts uh, have been identified as playing a really crucial role in, in kind of driving our behaviours and how we cope with maybe threatening information, um, including stigma and, and so on. So harmful drinkers essentially view alcohol as an important part of their identity, um, particularly for you, through social groups, but all of those kind of uh, domains. Um, and might see alcohol as playing a really important role in terms of de-stressing and, you know, fulfilling kind of um, important functions in their life. So that, that forms a strong part of their identity. And I think this kind of person with an Andy Cap tattoo saying a way of life is quite a good way of just uh, kind of capturing how a positive drinking identity can be kind of very real. And so I wanted to talk a bit about uh, kind of this idea of motivated reasoning. So um, Basically, you know, we all have cognitive biases. We all make uh, judgments or evaluations about ourselves and our behaviours and about others around us that are kind of biased towards, um, you know, particularly building a kind of, uh, in, you know, a positive self-concept. So, you know, it's kind of pop, pop psychology ideas or examples like, you know, 92% of drivers or something think they're better than the average driver which is a kind of famous cognitive bias, the kind of halo effect, if you like. Um, but, you know, motivated reasoning and, or cognitive biases it can be really motivated by this need to protect the self, to maintain a positive view of, of one's uh, idea of oneself. But it can also be motivated by, you know, protecting the self from uncomfortable emotions. So, you know, fear or anxiety, um, you know, it's an uncomfortable uh, and undesirable state to be in. So our kind of motivated reasoning processes can be quite effective ways of managing those, those uh, thought processes. Um, and mistakes were made, but not by me, is quite a good kind of easy read or funny read about, about this. And then there's the much more serious scientific philosophical take um, by Lisa Bar Bartoletti, if you're really interested in, to, in it. So essentially motivated reasoning refers to rational thought processes that are motivated, motivated by psychological, psychological drivers. And, um, you know, just some common other examples could be vaccine skepticism, you know, if you could be motivated by an extreme fear of needles, you know, um, that would kind of, if you're really scared of needles, but don't want to admit that, you might just say, well, I don't think, the I don't believe in the vaccine or, you know, a lot of uh, this kind of discussion around distrust of the government feeding the kind of uh, fear of, um, of, the, of the kind of vaccine. And, you know, more common things like people just saying it's not my fault could be because people are, you know, fearful of the consequences of, of being, you know, taking of the response identified as being responsible for mistakes or indeed kind of feelings of low self-esteem, um, you know, it could be protective if, if, when you feel like you've made an error that leads to self-critical thoughts or feelings, then it would make sense to protect yourself from that by, by, not, by not thinking that it is your fault. And then in terms of alcohol use, of course, harmful drinkers might say, well, it's not a problem because they're scared of recognising the problem and the implications that has, such as maybe giving up drinking. So othering um, is a form of motivated reasoning that we might apply to, to harmful drinkers, whereby harmful drinkers point to non uh, point to their, sorry, they point to other drinkers um, as the problem, uh, protecting themselves from, you know, loss of a positive drinking identity or loss of alcohol as a valued resource, stigma, um, or the need to address their problem and the belief that it might require abstinence or treatment. So, so we know that many drinkers kind of point to others as the problem. Uh, and again, this is kind of the poll option three that most people voted for. Um, but we also see othering in other health contexts. Uh, so particularly mental health people, might, uh, people with uh, mental health issues might, you know, reject the, the kind of mental illness label and point to others. But we also see this obviously in politics and tribalism, you know, uh, which can lead to very dangerous and irrational behaviours where, you know, other groups or minorities are kind of targeted as, as kind of political, apparently politically motivated. And just some examples of kind of othering in, in the context of alcohol use. So this one person said, uh, who was a, uh, certainly a harmful drinker, I drink in moderation, like my daughter, she's alcoholic. 
I've seen her drink two bottles of vodka. She's terrible. I couldn't do that. So this person actually scored 10 out of a possible 12 on the audit C, but according to them, their drinking is not problematic because it's, it's uh, someone else. Um, and we can just see lots of examples of, of this in the literature. Um, but we might be able to uh, counter othering, for instance, with continuum beliefs. So othering essentially relies on constructing an outgroup, a social outgroup, such as alcoholics. Uh, uh, and we kind of create a dividing line and place ourselves on the safe, safe side of that as social drinkers. Um, but but uh, in, in kind of one of my PhD studies, we, we kind of expose people to continuum beliefs or harmful drinkers to continuum beliefs. And this showed that this increased their problem recognition. Uh, they were more likely to say, yeah, my drinking you know, is a bit of an issue maybe. Um, once they thought about alcohol use, is use on a kind of continuum. And it's essentially this idea that there is no us and them, there is no dividing line, rather than um, as this kind of audit C scoring index shows, you know, you could be kind of anywhere along a scale, uh, a kind of sliding scale approach rather than just a kind of binary problem uh, or not. So that's one way in which kind of problem framing, the way we think about alcohol problems can influence processes like problem recognition. Um, but there are other ways that uh, harmful drinkers maintain low problem recognition or reject change. So um, another way is kind of through what we might call defensive processing. Um, so despite regularly being exposed to informa other information that might indicate that their drinking is uh, risky or problematic, um, uh, you know, people might still kind of maintain this kind of low problem recognition. So health risk information, other drinkers, um, you know, even health problems, people might still maintain their, their kind of low problem recognition despite these cues. So defensive processing is an umbrella term for the ways in which the kind of uh, the mind might kind of resist or reject kind of health information or cues. And this tends to operate on a kind of subconscious level. Um, so most commonly the kind of defensive processing responses are things like avoidance. So essentially, you know, just your, your the kind of attention might divert away from things that, uh, that, that you kind of don't want to think about on a subconscious level. So, you know, famously uh, smokers, you know, who are, who are smoking will uh, not look at the graphic information warnings on, on the cigarette packet. So they might be effective maybe for preventing people taking up smoking, but people who already smoke, you know, there's kind of evidence that they just look away from, from those kind of scary labels. Um, people might also minimize or, or what we call derogate messages. So, you know, if someone, if you say to a smoker, oh, do you think about this kind of uh, risk of mouth cancer or whatever, they might just say, well, you know, it's, you know, everything gives you cancer or, you know, I don't quite believe the science or something like that. Um, uh, or they might just kind of say, you know, denial is used as a technical term in defensive processing literature where they might just say, no, it's not, it's not relevant to me, you know, I, I, I'm not at risk or whatever. And uh, that's maybe a bit more extreme or less common, but, but perhaps does happen. So essentially defensive processing is the kind of subconscious, just distracting ourselves or discarding information that might cause us to, uh, you know, reflect on, 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 on the behavior as problematic. But there's not a lot of research about defensive processing in alcohol use disorder groups. Um, so as one of my PhD studies, we did look at this defensive processing. and We found that harmful drinkers were, you know, heavily uh, cognitively biased or heavily motivated in uh, defensively processing risk information. So uh, we showed them the, this kind of classic health risk information and they were, you know, harmful drinkers showed compared to non-harmful drinkers, uh, much higher levels of avoidance, derogation, fear. They felt much more uncomfortable looking at it. And really interestingly, their, their susceptibility, you know, that how likely they thought they were to experience these kind of health effects, they just really downplayed. So harmful drinkers actually said that they were less susceptible to the health risks of heavy drinking than non-harmful drinkers. So that really just shows the extent of this motivated reasoning, this really highly biased 
um, you know, cognitive appraisal of, of personally relevant information. And most of the literature points to this again is about protecting the self concepts that you know that there's a kind of um, you know strong desire to protect your existing view of yourself as as not problematic not problematic or you know not doing anything wrong or, or stigmatizable. So um, so essentially, um, uh, as a, as a result uh, of kind of my PhD, we developed this um, a conceptual model to try and think about how we might try and uh, uh, kind of manage or, or kind of alter problem recognition, taking account of these very complex psychological and often subconscious processes. Um, so if we start off thinking about um, personally relevant information, so all the information or cues that are out there that might um, you know, affect a harmful drinker potentially or get them to think about their alcohol use as potentially problematic, whether that is just risk information or conversations or uh, brief interventions or even kind of personal health problems. How these, uh, how that information is understood or what effect it has in terms of the kind of subsequent thought processes can be affected by a wide range of what I call kind of problem framing factors or effects. So the kind of continuum belief uh, is one of those. So you might can kind of have a continuum belief or a very binary categorical belief. So those might have very different implications for how someone, you know, responds to that, that kind of information pointing to their, their alcohol use as potentially problematic. But there's a whole range of other important uh, kind of possible factors. So, so these kind of effects could lead to what we call threat control responses. So things like defensive processing or othering as we've explored. So particularly if, if the, the kind of information makes a person feel scared or threatened, um, then, then the kind of threat control response is, is, is triggered, perhaps at a subconscious level where you just look away or dismiss the information. But potentially, as we've seen with continuum beliefs, you can maybe frame these messages or interventions in ways that are more likely to trigger problem recognition as a kind of potentially good uh, starting point for a behavior change process. Um, and of course, there's lots of kind of moderators or other things that are really important in, in kind of determining what, what outcome might be more likely. Um, and it, this might be a bit of an ongoing process. So I'll be finishing in just a couple of slides, uh, just a conscious of time. Um, so this problem framing, uh, sorry, problem recognition model um, might have some important implications. It's based on kind of existing parallel process models that kind of combine the, the kind of dual nature of the way the mind might work at kind of uh, conscious and subconscious levels and, and as a kind of quite, quite complex interactive process. Um, and particularly these kind of point to the role of efficacy or self-efficacy as being really important. So if someone believe, doesn't believe that they can change a behavior, they're, they're, you know, they, they're very likely to avoid thinking about the information. Um, so efficacy enhancement seems to be a really important thing to think about in this as well. So I wanna kind of uh, test this model and I've got some kind of studies underway trying to, to, to kind of explore this further. Um, but, but if people are trying to promote awareness or raise education, um, or kind of promote education around alcohol risk and so on, I think they really need to pay more attention to the way in which uh, these kind of motivated reasoning processes might operate at a subconscious level. So just, you know, telling people what the recommended weekly guidelines are isn't going to kind of work unless you account for the, the more complex cognitive processes going on. So just finally, what can we do? I think most importantly, it's about recognizing that the, the behavior and motivation is often complex and, and takes, you know, is evaluated on a subconscious level. So again, you know, just simple information uh, messages, um, unit awareness or guidelines, you know, they're important, they might play a role, but on their own, they're probably not gonna change behavior for the reasons that, that have kind of been presented. Um, and, and language is probably one of these really important factors, I think, that, that kind of shapes the likelihood of responses. And, and that's, again, what I kind of tested through the kind of continuum belief experiment. But 
generally, I'd say if we can resist stigmatizing labels or labels that drive stereotypes or simplistic interpretations that might that might uh, encourage othering or kind of some of these more reductionist or counterproductive thought processes. Um, you know, we want to just try and have more nuanced, humanizing and non-stigmatizing conversations about alcohol use and problems. And I think the best way to do this is just to kind of promote um, and, and kind of share a more diverse range of lived experiences, just as kind of Adrian Charles has done. And you know, something called the Adrian Charles effect, where after the program aired, there was a you know, reported big spike in um, calls to, to, to support services and treatment services and uh, a paper by Claire Garnett where they've shown that, that downloads to the kind of Drink Less app also really significantly spiked. So I think just sharing these kind of humanizing stories and that promote kind of alcohol use and problems is a bit more complex rather than exactly as the, the poll uh, identified that it's not just about, you know, problem drinkers as a, another group that actually affects a, a far larger group of people. And, and I think there's some really positive signs. There's lots of kind of people coming out talking about positive sobriety and dry January and other people talking about their kind of problems in more nuanced ways that don't just fit those kind of more stereotypical uh, narratives, uh, again, as kind of Claire discussed in the last seminar. Um, so just, just to conclude, really, I think, you know, all of the poll responses are true to some degree, but I think as people ident correctly identified this problem of othering is, is really significant and hopefully I've presented some ideas on how we might kind of counter that a little bit. Um, so thanks very much for listening and I'm very happy to discuss further. Uh, thank you very much, uh, James. That was fascinating. And um, we really like um, to open this up for questions. And if you could put your questions into the Q&A um, box, uh, not the chat, the Q&A, then we can um, uh, use our time to um, uh, for, for James to answer those questions and we can explore the area a little bit more. I can't. Right. Uh -huh. I'm happy to share the slides. I was just uh, replying to yeah, a question yeah. about that. I'll send a uh, kind of yeah. shareable version. Right. We have our, our, our first. Um, um, it's a, a question. A it could be useful to encourage uh, a popular name for this kind of drinking as a preventative measure. I've heard heavy drink in some places, but in South America, we don't have a similar expression. So I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that, James. I, mean, I spent countless hours awake at night trying to think of what the best terminology and alternative languages uh, might be, uh, you know, particularly in trying, trying to promote this uh, kind of more continuum or, you know, um, varied nature of alcohol use and problems. Um, and it's difficult because there's an inherent um, tension between, you know, needing to simplify and put labels on things that we have as humans. And that's why some of the terms, uh, you, know, you know, more widely used, even though they're perhaps sometimes less helpful. Um, so I don't think there are easy answers. And I think that's why the power of just discussions and sharing lived experiences and so on is so important. But yeah, I, I mean, heavy drinking, um, you know, risky drinking, anything that doesn't kind of carry a, a stigma and place a kind of set of stereotypes and expectations on the person once they're given that label is preferable. But yeah, unfortunately, I don't think there's any perfect answers. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and their contact, you know, they, as you said, they're very much, um, it relates to other people's, the, the social world, their context, doesn't it? What what those, what a heavy drinker is uh, for one person could be different for someone else. So as you said, it's very complex. Um, uh, Mike Taylor would like to know what, uh, during your research, what age groups did you focus on? So this was adults. So people over the age of 18 were, eligible to participate in, in the research that we did. I think the average age uh, of the studies was, you know, generally in between sort of 30 to 50. So um, 
yeah, it was kind of quite a broad range, but yeah, perhaps fairly typical representative demographics. Um, and from Claire, Amelia, thinking about the continuum spectrum and the complexity of experience, how could this nuance be translated into alcohol policy and guidance? Uh, and a follow on to that, is it possible or is there an operational need for this, for this, for this more binary guidance? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. And I think, I, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think one thing, way of doing it is to promote more um, the idea of things like self-change and natural recovery. So, you know, in the alcohol field, we tend to talk about alcohol treatment. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, discussions run in the kind of mental health field as well. Um, but, you know, there's a very strong or an, often an assumption that if you have an alcohol problem, you need treatment. And I, and I don't think that's true. I think, you know, it's something like 80% of people who experience an addiction of some sort recover on their own. Um, of course, you know, once people develop a more severe level of dependency or addiction, then treatment becomes generally more uh, likely to be required or useful for recovery. But I, think, I do think we need to kind of shift from this idea that, that all problem drinkers need treatment and uh, and also to, um, you know, kind of dispel the myth that abstinence is the only way to recover that, you know, as Adrian Charles show, as, as I've experienced that, you know, that moderating your drinking is can be possible after having had some kind of an alcohol problem. Of course, that's very, you know, individually dependent and that's not to encourage anyone that's successfully found abstinence to suddenly try it, you know, is something you need to think about carefully and moderate drinking can be a lot harder than, than abstinence because you don't know where the line is. But, um, you, know, it's, you know, if we if we open up the idea that, that positive drinking change can include reducing your drinking, that, that opens it up to a lot more people, including many heavy drinkers who will never go near a treatment service or never consider giving up drinking altogether because that idea is too scary. So I think it's a really important question that, yeah, policy, um, public discourse, all of us, we all need to kind of just try and embed that continuum idea at kind of all levels. So great question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Don Schenker. Uh, and he says, James, can you say a bit more about the conceptual model and any examples of how this applies in practice? Well, I mean, there are lots of, uh, as I said, it's kind of based on um, other existing dual process models, mostly the uh, kind of testing what, what's often called as the fear appeal literature. So, you know, testing these messages that are trying to, um, you know, appear to uh, appeal to people's kind of fear-based responses. So telling smokers, you know, the, the, the risks of cancer or, or drinkers indeed. Um, and so things like the extended parallel process model, you know, they're quite well empirically tested to show that, 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 that these kind of processes are, are what happens when people are exposed to these information and how they might often discredit or reject it, or it just sort of bounces off them, particularly if they don't feel they can change the behavior. Um, but, but yeah, in terms of, of alcohol use specifically, you know, um, you know, it's something that, that hasn't really been uh, tested, but something I'm kind of trying to do at the moment is develop studies that show how we might manage increased problem recognition and more importantly, increased behavioral changes as a result of that. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Karen Duke. Thank you so much, James. That was a fascinating talk. I was wondering, oh, I've just lost it. Um, uh, I was wondering about temporary aspects, i.e. harmful um, drinking over time. How long does one have to be a harmful drinker? Any thoughts on this? Yeah, so it's another great question because, you know, harmful drinking, again, is a bit of a, um, you know, it's, it's a bit simplistic because we know that if we look at people who fit the definition of harmful drinking, you know, for instance, there's the unit thresholds, you'll find all types of different drinking motives, you know, people who might not drink hard, hardly at all during the week, but then go out on the weekend and drink loads in one go versus people that never go out and never get feel like they're drunk but drink very consistently or heavy regularly on a on, on kind of every night of the week so 
um, yeah, we're kind of just generalizing in the sense that um, I think the important thing is that, that harmful drinkers are people that regularly drink in a harmful way. And, but, but the important thing is that despite having harmful level of alcohol use, they will say that it's not a problem and we need to think about how to reach them more effectively. And I think that applies to both, you know, lots of people in that harmful drinking category, even though they're a very heterogeneous group that they might include kind of so-called binge drinkers or regular home drinkers and so on. They're all kind of united by this kind of low problem recognition and othering of, of problem drinkers as, a, as an issue. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question is from Ian Websell. Thank you so much for the brilliant talk. I wondered if you had used a behavioural, uh, psychological or health psychological theoretical framework to underpin your PhD proposal. And if so, what did you use? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, lots. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of remember starting my PhD and just, uh, um, you know, just finding so many kind of theoretical frameworks, particularly in terms of, um, you know, these kind of uh, health psychology frameworks for, you know, there's kind of famously the illness perception model, self, self-regulation model of, um, uh, of, of illness uh, and so on, where, you know, kind of different theories about, or, or models about how people do think about and integrate, um, you know, their cognitions, and how that relates to their behavior. So I was kind of going through them all and then I kind of mostly came down to this extended parallel process model, particularly for the defensive processing. But um, you know, I think you know, most of the contemporary ones do, do share a lot of the very you know, same basic principles and you know, particularly in things like the role of efficacy, that if you want to change behavior, people have to believe that they do it. And of course, that's why treatment interventions will often be very, um, you know, a lot of it will be about building a person's belief that they, they can change and, you know, you know, try not to think about, well, I just have to do it all in one go, you know, whatever form of behavior it is, couch to 5k, for instance, you don't get up and just run, a, do, go from no exercise to running a 5k, you build it up slowly. And with that, your efficacy builds up your belief and your ability to do that. So, um, so yeah, I think all those models are really interesting, but you know, I think we can kind of, can, I got lost in the detail of them. Yes, yes. Especially at the beginning when you're trying to, yes, find your way. Uh, question from Betsy Tom. James, excellent as usual. I believe in some countries, reluctant to accept the label of problem drinker is also affected by the way healthcare is funded through insurance. A negative label can be an economic burden any info on this so um i think this is kind of referring you know to to america where you know there's obviously uh, a much a much larger degree of belief in sort of addiction as a disease or alcohol problems as a disease and you know there's a long kind of political history of that because you know health insurance um, will cover you if you have a, a kind of disease and therefore you know lobbying for addiction to be called as a, a disease it gives people access to healthcare resources um, but of course there's again the tension in terms of you know what are the implications for a disease model so you know I'm very interested in how it you know may alleviate stigma in some ways uh, through mutual aid support groups but it also probably contributes to public stigma because people see people with diseases as different and other and, and that probably drives stigma um, so yeah problem drinking again you know a bit like harmful drinking it's it's kind of maybe the least worst option um, in terms of you know we've got to describe alcohol use and problems and we've got to kind of use labels to do that somehow but if we can do so avoiding kind of stigmatizing um, reductionist concepts as much as possible then then that's why something like problem drinker might be favourable, but it's still not perfect. Um, oops. Oh, right. Uh, the next one, it's labelled Pixel 3, which sounds more like somebody's... It's a, I've got smartphone. 
Um, yeah. How can you use continuum beliefs and the information on defensive processing to motivate clients to recognize they may have a problem? That's a great question. Yeah. So um, in, in my experimental studies, we basically showed people a video of a person talking about their alcohol problems in, in a continuum way. So what they basically said is, you know, I experienced some alcohol problems, my drinking had kind of crept up over time. Um, but, but, you know, I don't think I'm that different from most people. I've actually changed it now, I've cut down, I've recognised it was a bit of a problem. Uh, and so, you know, I think anybody, you know, might want to think about keeping an eye on their drinking and being aware that alcohol problems could happen to anyone. Um, you know, that kind of idea that, that just, you know, continuum is maybe a bit of a technical term, but it's just that it's just kind of trying to present, um, you know, this idea that, that anybody drunk, drank heavily over time would be at risk of, of harms rather than they than being kind of somehow fundamentally different. Um, and again, I think, you know, the, the Adrian Charles effect, the effect of the documentary on lots of people downloading drink drink monitoring apps and seeking help was because the documentary presented a more continuum idea of alcohol use and problems by showing Adrian Charles' experience and lots of other people's experience and therefore just showed how it's nuanced and complicated rather than the kind of more traditional idea of this kind of alcoholics who have a disease and everybody else. Right. Um We've got a few minutes left, so we'll try and get through the rest of the questions. Uh, hi, Jane. This is from Anya. Hi, James. Thanks for a great lecture. I was interested in your mention of social paradigms in the context of in-groups and out-groups. Do you think harmful drinking occurs mainly in a group context as opposed to dependent drinking, which seems to be more individual? Yeah, another really good question. Yeah, I is, think... Um, you know, like it's it's kind of a one of the key psychology concepts is this kind of in group and out grouping that as humans, you know, we're very um, you know social identity theory. We define ourselves by the groups that we belong to. Uh, that's how you know we see ourselves, and that definitely happens with drinking. You know, huge literature on on the kind of um, the nature of drinking as a social thing, and you know, we tend to as humans want to socialize and be surround ourselves with the people that, that that like doing and like the things that we like doing you know we don't want to disrupt or have kind of um you know opinions or behaviors that are counter to our own self-view that makes us feel uncomfortable so yeah i think you know harmful drinking does definitely occur in a group context i think there's i'd, I'd say there's a risk to kind of falsely again separating harmful drinking and dependent drinking even though I realize I made a case for that at the start. Um, I suppose if we look at very severely dependent drinking you know when alcohol problems become really severe then perhaps it does become more more individual and you know people will just drink on their own perhaps um, more because they are dependent and they need to just drink at all times whereas when you don't have dependence maybe you know because you don't you're not dependent you can not drink in more occasions so I, I kind of get where you're coming from but I, I sort of I'm cautious to to kind of generalize because I think it is so so complex but yeah the, the kind of in-group out-group thing I think is so important both in terms of um, drinking practices but also just politics more broadly you know what we've seen with Trumpism and Brexit and you know the kind of the direction that we're unfortunately seem to be heading with kind of uh, populism, um, you know, are very much relies on this kind of outgrouping and blaming a, an outgroup. And we know from history how dangerous that can be. Um, I think we're going to sort of run out of time. Sorry, everybody. So if I take a couple more questions, and I also have to, that Karen said that there was, um, it was meant to be temporal effects, the auto uh, correct on, um, the uh, chat, <laughs> yeah, makes sense. quite funny, but anyway. Uh, so just a couple, um, I think you've probably covered quite a lot, lot of this next question, but from James, hi, is there a difference between a harmful drink and an alcoholic? Does one always lead to the other? 
Yeah, I was kind of touching on this in the last question. Yes. I would yeah. just kind of say, I mean, I wouldn't use the term alcoholic. I think it's, um, as I said, it's kind of associated with a disease model idea. Um, it, it, we don't use it in our kind of medical or policy uh, guidance anymore. Um, but, but if we assume it to mean alcohol dependence, I should say that, you know, of course, people can self-identify as alcoholics as they typically do within Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not suggesting people shouldn't do that, but, but just in, in kind of more technical and less stigmatizing terminology, generally, we just refer to alcohol dependence. But yeah, as I said, the, you know, these cutoffs are always arbitrary and that's part of what the continuum is that, you know, some people will have very mild degrees of, of dependence and, um, uh, you know, how you differentiate that from harmful drinking, I'd say, whether you should at all, probably not. Mm. Um, this one I think is probably quite a quick question um, from Cheryl Williams. What was the economic status of your study group? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was mixed. But I think, it, again, it wasn't too dissimilar from being representative in terms of, you know, most people, um, uh, you know, kind of employed or in some form of work and so on. But uh, I'd have to get back to you if you wanted a more detailed answer on that. Yeah, as I said, I'm conscious of the time. So I think if you just, I'm sorry, I mean, it's fantastic with so many questions, but obviously people probably have other places to go to. So I think, um, can we just, yeah, I'll just squeeze in the last question, which isn't the last question. Um, James, this is from John McQuaid. Do you think that some people are unable to consider and make required changes due to the lack of service provision, particularly psychosocial counselling interventions? Um, sorry, can you just yes, sorry. just repeat the start? Yeah. Do you think? Oh, I got it. I've got it. I've got the question. Are, are Thanks. Yeah. To consider and make the required changes due to a lack of service provision in relation to sort of psychosocial um and uh, sure. Yeah, I think I think I think lack of accessible services and the stigma of accessing treatment is a big barrier. And you know, I'm a big fan of. Um, you know, in Sweden, um, there's kind of more common models, I think, around kind of primary care based psychosocial interventions. So people don't have to go to a, a treatment service, you know, and, uh, you know, there's kind of something called modified labeling theory where people, the act of going and engaging in a service kind of gives you this, this label or identity of having a problem that is obviously stigmatizing and you know people resist so I think trying to make interventions more widely accessible outside of traditional treatment settings is, is definitely going to be desirable from that point of view but but yeah as I said earlier I think it's also important to support support self-change whether that's through just beliefs and understanding that self-change is possible uh, or you know whether it's kind of more access to online resources or you know, um, what we call, what I call bibliotherapy, you know, workbooks to help you manage your drinking or all the apps that are available now. Right, I thank you. So I'm sorry, I think we are going to have to draw, uh, draw oh, it. I can't to, hear you, Rachel. To, oh. Oh. I'm not sure what's happened. Still can't hear you. <laughs> there we are. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. I don't know if that's anything to do with me. Can you hear me or not? Um, we can hear you, Rachel. Hear you. I'm not sure. Oh. Yes, I don't know. I, it said that I was unmuted, but uh, I'm just... I said can't hear I, at all, I'm afraid. I'm not sure what happened there, but I think we were near the end. Yes. Yeah, so, um, is it, are people... I just wanted to close quickly, hopefully some, some people... Yet, you're not on mute, but I, I just can't hear you. I don't know if... Um, um, it must be a problem James is, ha is having because uh, we, can, we can hear you, Rachel. All oh, right, okay. Sorry. Yeah. I, guess I just I wanted just to say um, uh, thank anything, you, James, so, um, and also to thank you for all your um, questions. I'm sorry we couldn't quite get through them. And also to say that um, we are going to be planning some further dark webinars later um, in the year. Uh, so um, there will be information being 
um, distributed. And also, as um, some of you who've been to the uh, previous webinars will know that um, DARC is now has, uh, recently begun to host the UK chapter of ISEP. And uh, which is the International Society for uh, Substance Use Professionals. And we're going to have our um, launch on the 23rd of June. And that will also uh, mark the start of a webinar series that we're going to do on uh, substance use and families. So again, watch this space. There will be some information um, coming out. And also ISAP is a membership organization. It's free to join. And so um, please, um, uh, have a look at the um, website and um, we really encourage you to join our chapter. So thank you everybody. Goodbye.